and this is another episode of the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology podcast, Spotlights. Uh, so this time, I just wanted to chat a little bit about metamodernism and uh, kind of introduce the term for people who haven't heard about it and suggest some reasons why it might be kind of confusing and misleading in some ways. Uh, one of the things I've studied a lot in my own work is postmodernism. And ever since postmodernism showed up, like in the middle of the 20th century, uh, people have been wanting to get beyond it and uh, calls for a post postmodernism, uh, however silly that term might seem with so many prefixes. Uh, those kinds of uh, extra posts have been showing up for a while. And that often is oversimplifying what postmodernism is. And it's getting too caught up in a desire for the new, the new and improved. And uh, so there's a lot of reasons why we still have a lot to learn from postmodernism and why we don't have to claim that we're getting past it. Uh, it's okay that we're still in that period in a lot of ways. But it's also the case that maybe even the term postmodernism is uh, misleading and that we're still really dealing with conditions of modernity. And even modernism might be a little misleading. You might be familiar with Bruno Latour's work, We Have Never Been Modern where he shows that a lot of what we think of as uh, modernity didn't fully happen. The idea that we could separate nature from culture, uh, it's like, well, we never fully did. We might have done it in theory, but not in practice. And uh, did we you know, become fully rational or whatever different modern philosophers are saying? It's like some things we said we were doing, but we didn't actually accomplish uh, for better or for worse. And so just the very idea of breaking up history into periods can can be a little confusing. So this isn't to say that we don't want to tell big stories uh, to account for our history and that we need some stages in the history to help make sense of it. So I'll try and just give a little outline of all that stuff. Uh, so what is metamodernism? I'll just kind of start with that. Uh, this is something, it's a term that's been around for a little over a decade now. I think uh, people would generally situate the origin of it in uh, 2010, uh, a couple theorists uh, Timothy S. Vermeulen and Robin Vandenacker uh, kind of coined that term together and worked on uh, some uh, some pieces together, including something called Notes on Metamodernism. And so you can find a lot of uh, their material online pretty easily. And it was, you know, their their version of a post postmodernism. And, you know, they say, you know, postmodernism was so mired in cynicism and irony um, critiques of meta narratives, you know, you can't have big stories or big picture thinking. And so they suggest that something is happening in the 21st century where people are returning to sincerity, to, you know, away from irony, uh, to a sincere search for truth and not just skepticism, uh, not always taking things apart and deconstructing them, but constructing something, right? Trying to have a constructive impact on the world. And so that all sounds very nice. And uh, certainly, you know, don't want to discourage people from using the term. It can be a, a rallying cry for people who are like-minded and, oh, you're into metamodernism, so am I. We can hang out and work together. So there might be good reasons uh, to use the term. Uh, and of course, also important to clarify that for them, uh, the meta isn't just going beyond modernism. It's also being between things. It's not being beyond modernism and postmodernism. They're trying to be between modernism and postmodernism as well as beyond postmodernism. So, you know, it's not just a move for transcendence. So some very thoughtful stuff coming out of that. Uh, more recently in 2021, uh, Jason Ananda Josephson Storm uh, published a, a lovely book called Metamodernism, the Future of Theory. And similarly in there, it's, a, it's the same kind of point. We need to get past all of the focus on irony and super reflexivity and skepticism. And we need to return to, you know, big picture thinking, sincerity, Right, an earnest search for truth, truth with a capital T. Um, and so part of what he's thinking is, you know, we need to deconstruct deconstruction, that sort of stuff. So that all sounds OK to me, you know, and again, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from getting into it. What I want to encourage people to do is look again at postmodernism, because actually all these ideas are already there. Postmodernism was never just about irony and skepticism. And deconstruction wasn't about destroying things. Uh, so I want to clarify a little of that and, and suggest that we still have a lot to learn from postmodernism. And if uh, metamodernism is a word that helps you collaborate with others, great. 
but don't let it confuse you about what the word postmodernism meant and what that period of philosophy and history uh, was really all about. Um, so I guess we can start with the ancients maybe. Let's go back a little bit and keep in mind that irony and skepticism weren't invented by postmodernists. Uh, it was really early on in the flourishing of Greek philosophy uh, about 2,500 years ago, where you had cynicism with people like Diogenes, right? Uh, skepticism and uh, the whole idea of being cynical and skeptical that was intrinsic to philosophy from the beginning. And of course, Socrates was very famous for his irony. So irony, cynicism, skepticism, these are ancient phenomena. It didn't just show up in the postmodern world. And of course, in modernity, there's likewise plenty of skepticism. I know David Hume is a famous skeptic. And uh, the hermeneutics of suspicion that Paul Ricoeur identified in people like Marx and Nietzsche and Freud, you know, people were having these suspicious, paranoid readings of things, right? Being very skeptical, very critical. Uh, that was in modernity. It was in the ancient world. And, uh, and then a new variety of that showed up in postmodernism. But it's not so intrinsically and irreducibly new that we need to situate it as a postmodern invention. So postmodernism, it wasn't the inventor of irony. And furthermore, it wasn't only ironic. There is a lot of sincerity. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the sincere, uh, the sincere forms of postmodernism and the way that like big picture thinking and search for truth and those things were actually happening in, in most of the thinkers identified as postmodern. So I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, first, I wanna just talk a little bit more about how confusing the term is in terms of just periodizing, right? Uh, the word modernism is already a little confusing because in, in history, we're going to say modernism started maybe around the colonial period, right? 1492, with Christopher Columbus. You can situate it there. Maybe you could go back a little further. Some people say modernism started more in like the 1300s with people like Duns Scotus, and that he really set the stage for what would become modernism. So there's different ways to think about it. You could think of people like Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon, like the 16 and 1700s. Um, that you know, so it's it's a broad broad strokes. It gets confusing because in the art world, modern art is something that happened in the late 1800s. And then postmodernism shows up after World War II. So, you know, I'm not trying to be too uh, cut and dry about these categories because um, some of the people in the meta modern world are mainly thinking about art and culture. Some people are thinking more historically and philosophically. So, the word, you know, exactly when modernism starts and when postmodernism starts is a little fuzzy, uh, and that's okay. It's uh, okay to have some fuzzy boundaries and uh, multiple meanings when we're using these terms. So I thought that was worth uh, pointing out. But one of the points I really want to make is that the basic conditions of postmodernism are still with us. And uh, a lot of what postmodernism meant wasn't that we're beyond modernism. It really kind of meant modernism has fully covered the planet. And so there's a sort of closure there that's making us see it in a new way. Uh, it really correlates with post-industrialization, right? Post-industrial development uh, and uh, post-colonialism. Those are the posts that all kind of hang out together. And what was post-industrial development? Uh, communication and information technologies, right? Industrialization was not doing that. And then all of a sudden, middle of the 20th century, as uh, you know, computers start to take off, and people really start to you know lead their lives uh, and our socioeconomic system using computers, using uh, digital technology, stuff like that. Post-industrial didn't mean we're no longer industrial, right? It meant that there's this new layer to it, and we're still very much industrial in our development, we're still using fossil fuels to power our machines, right? Uh, the difference is there's just this new layer of communication and information tech. So similarly, post-colonialism didn't mean colonialism is just over. It meant it, it's kind of fully wrapped around the planet, and that a new layer has emerged. A lot of what people refer to as post-colonialism is really neo-colonialism. I mean, let's just take the example of India, right? Uh, India enters its post-colonial phase when uh, the British Empire leaves, right? When India gained independence in 1947, you could say now it's post-colonial. And so that happened to a lot of colonies, 
right? After World War II, everybody was giving back the colonies. Okay, you get to be an independent nation, you get to be an independent nation. And so that move toward independence looked on the surface like colonialism is done and we're, everybody's free now and there's independence for everybody. And yet a new kind of colonialism shows up where it's kind of just the same old colonialism by another name. And now it's uh, global capitalism, right? It's neoliberalism. Uh, so again, taking the case of India, 1947, India is an independent nation. And then in the 1960s, here comes the green revolution, right? Where India industrialized its agricultural system uh, at a really rapid rate, getting into you know industrial agriculture, chemical pesticides and fertilizers, that whole thing. Uh, one of the early instances of somebody using the word green in a way that was in no way sustainable or equitable, right? It's a classic example of greenwashing. And people like Vandana Shiva have been complaining about this for decades, right? And the whole idea that somebody like Gandhi had of village Swaraj, right? Self-ruling subsistence villages uh, that got destroyed by the Green Revolution. And it's still there and people are working on getting that village culture uh, thriving and uh, yet the forces of capitalism pushing agribusiness onto India still exist. So that's neocolonialism, right? It's all the uh, kind of loans that countries were pressured to take out and uh, from you know, the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, all that kind of stuff. So one of the reasons I think it's important not to think that we're beyond postmodernism is because we're not done with the problem of postcolonialism, neocolonialism. That's still very much with us. And uh, you can see this in struggles in North America for land back initiatives for indigenous people, right? If we were done with the legacies of colonialism slash post-colonialism, then you'd see a lot more land being given back to indigenous people. We don't see that yet. So I, I worry about the idea that we've entered this new phase and we can leave postmodernism behind us. That sounds lovely. Uh, but the material conditions of our current reality are such that we don't want to pretend that we're done with the post-colonial colonial dynamic or for that matter with the legacies of industrial and post-industrial technology these are still very much with us uh the increasing attention to artificial intelligence in the last couple of years is a pretty good example because it's a clear example of digital technology you know post-industrial development and it uses computers that are plugged in, right? Uh, people often forget that there's a lot of energy that goes behind all the computational processes because you, you know, your computer might not be using that much energy. It's plugged into the wall or something, but the servers that you're sending information to when you're communicating to an artificial intelligence chat bot, or when you're just sending a tweet or posting something on Instagram or Facebook, that's using a lot more electricity than just what's on your computer. And that electricity is often powered by fossil fuels. Right. So a clear example, we're not done with industrialization, which is just ravaging the planet. And we're not done with the post-industrial layer of communication and information technologies. That's still with us. And of course, the kind of AI chatbots that people talk to on uh, the Internet these days are certainly new, but not irreducibly new. These are actually sort the sorts of things that postmodern philosophers were already talking about. Not exactly because they weren't trying to predict the future, but they did recognize that our current uh, technological and socioeconomic system is blurring the lines between real and artificial in, in very complicated ways. And uh, for instance, Jean Baudrillard's work, work uh, Simulacra and Simulation, could easily be seen as a commentary on the 2020s, right? Um, Jacques Derrida's book of Grammatology, likewise understood the complexity of code and of systems of meaning. And so, you know, when he's talking about writing, he doesn't just mean words on a page. Derrida's concept of writing and difference uh, are concepts that apply to digital code as well, as well as genetic coding for that matter. Uh, so again, let's keep reading these postmodern philosophers. We're not done with them. And uh, they still have a lot to teach us. And they still have a lot of uh, attention that they can help us pay to the complicated socioeconomic and technological conditions of our lives. So again, it doesn't mean we don't want to use the word metamodern to signal how much we care about sincerity and we don't want to get stuck in the irony. Uh, but also important to know 
there was a sincere form of postmodernism. So as I said, that's, you know, what I'm heading to here, along with saying that the periodization is a little misleading because metamodernism is not totally new. We're still stuck in the colonial and industrial worlds of modernism and postmodernism. Uh, but also, we don't want to caricature postmodernism as being just pure irony and skepticism. Far from it. Uh, in fact, there was a movement in postmodernism called constructive postmodernism. A lot of times when people think of postmodernism, the first thing they think about is Jean-Francois Lyotard's book in the 70s uh, and uh, on the postmodern condition, where he defines postmodernism as incredulity toward meta narratives. Right. So people go, oh, right. It's incredulous. You just don't believe meta narratives anymore. And that's true. That is his definition of it. But even then, he's mostly talking about meta narratives of progress in modernity, right? The meta narrative that says that all the destruction around us is actually a sign of progress and that things are getting better. And he's like, it's hard to believe that now. But by the 1970s, it was hard to believe that progress was really working out that well. Uh, at that point, the environmental crisis was clear, right? People knew what was going on. Uh, right, 1970 was the first Earth Day. So by the 70s, people knew our relationship to the environment is disastrous. And so it's hard to believe that modernity is just working out. That's the meta narratives. It wasn't all meta narratives as such that we have incredulity toward. That would obviously be self refuting. That would be a meta narrative, right? To say, we no longer believe any meta narratives whatsoever, that would be a meta narrative. So that, that wasn't, you know, Leotard's smarter than that. He wasn't saying all meta narratives are, uh, are false and uh, we should be incredulous toward them. No, specifically modern meta narratives about progress and emancipation. So, anyway, that's what people first think of. And then they think of deconstruction. Jacques Derrida, right? Derrida's term deconstruction, which he adapts from Martin Heidegger. Uh, and so that's one kind of part of it. But there's also this thing called constructive postmodernism, and that generally includes people like Charles Sanders Peirce, uh, John Dewey, Alfred North Whitehead, right? And so those are people who were leaving behind the modern paradigm, and uh, which focus is, is very like individualistic, it's too rationalistic, it leaves emotion and imagination behind, um, and uh, too focused on a nature culture dualism. And so they move past all of that in very constructive ways. And of course, Dewey in particular, right, his concern for democracy, this isn't just some reflective word games. He's trying to make a difference in his world, right? He's trying to make a, a positive contribution to society that makes people free. There's absolute sincerity and a search for truth um, and pragmatic impacts on the world. Like that's that's all there. Uh, so no need to uh, to erase postmodernism. We might want to focus on the constructive side of postmodernism. I haven't seen anything in metamodernism that isn't in constructive postmodernism. So, you know, not to be like the old man who's like, I don't trust these newfangled terms, <laughs> but because uh, again, I love neologisms are great, but uh, I I would uh, just warn people don't let this uh, be an excuse to not pay attention to what all these writers associated with postmodernism were doing. Uh, especially constructive postmodernism, they can help us uh, deal with these issues so that we can still have sincerity in our lives and uh, and irony and still play and still laugh. But don't forget sincerity. Don't forget real world impacts are important. And uh, and don't forget that we need to address the problems of our post-colonial and post-industrial uh, socioeconomic system. So one more point and uh, and then I'll leave you alone. Uh, and that's also that deconstruction is always misunderstood uh, in these contexts. Uh, whenever metamodern people are talking about deconstruction, it's always kind of the crass meaning of deconstruction is just destroying something. It's just critiquing it, pulling it apart, ripping it apart, and showing how it's just masking some inequality or some you know unfair power relations or something like that. And that's uh, simply not true. Deconstruction has a critical edge to it, uh, like a lot of philosophy does. Um, but the whole idea is that it's supposed to be inventive and it is supposed to contribute toward a more just world. And it's supposed to have a creative relationship to the texts that it's analyzing. Um, so, you know, as Derrida himself says, deconstruction is inventive or it's nothing at all. 
So people have written about this a lot too. So at a certain point, I'm just like, how are people still misunderstanding deconstruction? So uh, completely counter to the intent of it. There's a, like a messianic hope in deconstruction. Many people have written about this. So many writings. John Caputo is probably maybe the best known uh, interpreter of Derrida in this regards and showing the, the religious side of it that, you know, it's not just word games. It's not just irony. You know, there are prayers and tears of Jacques Derrida. There's a messianic hope, a hope for justice to come. And, uh, and that deconstruction is never just reading, like if you're reading Freud and you're going to deconstruct Freud, like, no, that's not how it works. And we're not trying to take Freud apart. Deconstruction is actually trying to find moments in a text where the text surprises itself. It's trying to open up spaces for creativity. So not at all about taking things down a notch. And it's really about opening up new possibilities in unforeseen and surprising places. In that sense, it's very similar to mystical theology. A lot of mystical theology has this kind of negative or apophatic dimension, right? Unsaying. So the Bible tells us God is good, but then mystical theology says God is beyond our concept of good, right? And so there's something bigger than good. God is, God exists, and yet there's something beyond being. And so, the, you know, apophatic theology is always unsaying the words we use to describe God, not to criticize them or take them down a peg, but to try and open them up to a more intense experience, right? To try and really let the full reality show up, a reality that exceeds what we can put into our words. Uh, so lots of, lots of writings showing that there's this kind of connection with apophatic theology, uh, messianic thought, uh, so, uh, Catherine Keller in particular, I think has the best formulation for this. And that's that the distinction between constructive and deconstructive postmodernism is a fallacy, a fallacy of misplaced opposition, as she calls it, similar to what Whitehead calls a fallacy of misplaced concreteness and, uh, deconstructive postmodernism is plenty constructive. It's inventive, it's creative, and it's sincere and, uh, just read the books. Derrida's love for friendship, for justice, uh, for hospitality, uh, for truth. And uh, it's, it's all pretty clearly there. Uh, so keep reading those things. The constructive side of postmodernism, the so-called deconstructive side. Everybody's really thinking deeply about the complicated world that we're living in. And, uh, and believe it or not, even though things are changing rapidly right now, uh, they're not categorically different from what these people were writing about in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, you know, somebody like Derrida passed away early in the 21st century, uh, Paul Ricoeur, early 21st century. So they were around that whole time. Things haven't changed that much from what they were writing about just 20 to 30 years ago. So keep reading. That's generally my advice uh, for everybody, <laughs> just read and, uh, and don't get too caught up in trends. And, uh, but that doesn't mean don't get caught up at all in trends. You can play around with the idea of metamodernism and it could spark some new ideas, new thoughts, new forms of community. Uh, so that's all good. Uh, just don't let it be an excuse to not pay attention to all the issues raised by postmodern thinkers, right? Still engage that kind of stuff and, uh, and do it sincerely, not just to find out where the postmoderns were wrong or we can do better, right? That kind of critical operation is exactly what metamodernism says we need to stop doing. Uh, we don't need the paranoid reading all the time where we're trying to unmask the hidden dynamics of power and injustice in a text. We need reparative readings, right? Uh, or as Paul Ricoeur said, we need to move from a hermeneutics of suspicion to a hermeneutics of affirmation. And uh, he called that hermeneutics of affirmation post-critical, right? And so that was already in postmodernism. We don't just want to be critical all the time. Somebody like Ricoeur said, we need to be affirmative, right? We need to be sincere. Uh, I especially appreciate this because Thomas Berry uses the term post-critical naivety and that we need to have this return to a sincere engagement with the world doesn't mean we've left critique behind, but that we've moved beyond it to include it within a deeper form of sincere engagement with the world, more affirmative engagement with the world. Uh, so we can carry both of those hermeneutics of suspicion and hermeneutics of affirmation, and uh, and we can do so in a way that really honors the best writings that are associated with the world of postmodernism and uh, without using kind of crass distinctions like constructive or deconstructive, like uh, just 
pay attention. And maybe we don't even have to worry if they're postmodern or not. Uh, somebody like Derrida is a good example. He never ever uses the term postmodernism except to say that he never ever uses the term. And so he didn't situate himself like that. Well, there's more complex ways of thinking of yourself in different timelines and different historical periods. And, uh, and if words like postmodernism are helpful to you, go for it. If metamodernism is helpful, enjoy. Uh, but try to read everybody and, uh, and be careful. So that's uh, my thought on it in a nutshell and uh, just one thought. And I'm excited to see what's going to continue coming out of it because the enthusiasm from people who are into metamodernism is, uh, is really special. Anytime there's any kind of theoretical or cultural or philosophical movement where people are really excited about possibilities, about creativity, about the search for truth, I think that's ultimately a good thing. It's just my job as the guy who knows some stuff about postmodernism to say, well, it's not exactly the right characterization and will be stronger as a movement if we pay a little closer attention uh, to the thinkers and the movements that are part of our histories. All right, so that's it for now. I'll be back again with some more conversations uh, with other people who are not myself uh, pretty soon. So in the meantime, take care. Be well.